Here's this great story in front of me. Where's the lead picture? Where are the narrative threads? Is everything here? Will a photographer go back? I mean, it's not unusual for a photographer who may have to go back. Nick spent a year in the Redwoods. He spent a year dreaming and imagining a photograph. We don't know if we're going to succeed. What I do know is we're going to make a photograph. I don't think we'll stop until we get it right. Number one, the assignment, the world's tallest trees. Nick Nichols' photograph of a redwood tree, top to bottom. This just may be my favorite photograph of the year. I've worked in forests for my whole life, and I just never could photograph the tree properly. Nick Nichols has been making pictures for National Geographic magazine for more than 20 years. His most recent assignment, to photograph California's giant redwoods. I don't know why it's so hard to make a beautiful picture of a tree. Maybe, maybe it's because we see them, but the truth is you don't see a tree. When you stand at the bottom of our tree, you see about the bottom 16th of it. You could walk by this tree a million times and never think it's a spectacular tree, but I've got to pull away from it and find a way for you to see it. Steve Sill and these guys have to shoot a crossbow up. They climb up the tree and then they shoot another crossbow over to another tree and put a line across. Now you're gonna drop a line down the middle. So now you're out in open space. You have a line that's in the open space. And I climbed up the rope and looked and said, ah, oh, now you can see this tree. We have the unobstructed view, but now we've got our camera spinning in space. And a still camera has to be stationary. I just painted myself into a corner and finally I got trapped in my own tree where I couldn't even see the tree that I was looking at. We finally figured out if we raised this camera up into the air on this line, you could see the tree all the way. So we came up with the idea of putting three 35 millimeter cameras together to create um, a panoramic that we would shoot in layers. Looks good so far. Oh yeah. We're building a tree out of 90 photographs. You know, first we had to get everything to work. I see the biggest challenge is actually creating something that looks good in the heart of the tree by the main trunk. It may not be doable, but we're gonna try. The robotic camera system is going to be probably about 50 feet away from the tree. I get on the computer and see if it's talking to the cameras. Then we, we run it up the tree to the top. Oh, nice. Exposure, see? Sweet. That's nice. yeah. We actually shot um, three photographs at a time, lowered the camera three meters, shot another three frames, lowered the camera again, shot another three frames, and so on. We would take bracketed exposures all the way down. In the end, we end up with 84 images. I feel like that this photograph that we made is gonna end up standing for far more than trees because we got these humans standing in the tree we're going to feel like this has something to do with our relationship to the planet at this critical time. I mean, that tree's been standing for 1,600 years. How many of me and you have come and gone in that time? Every page of the April issue of National Geographic magazine is devoted to the world's fresh water supply. One place we had to go was the Middle East, where water is such an important part, not just of life, but of politics too. And the Jordan River, for thousands of years, has been the lifeblood for many in the Middle East. We sent Paolo Pellegrin there and we knew he would 
make the honest photographs we needed in this very combustible part of the world. This was actually my first assignment for the National Geographic. The Water War was a special issue so that the Geographic did. I was asked to shoot on the, the Jordan River, which is sort of an, an important sort of source of fresh water. It's, it's, it's also a divided river, sort of three countries and three communities, the Israelis, the Palestinians, and the Jordanians. And so it has a number of social, territorial, sort of political sort of complexities to it. Dead Sea has a strange, sort of, nearly sort of metallic sort of quality to it. It's a place which is so sort of charged sort of, with history and, and, and symbolisms also. It really sort of contains so much of our religious sort of, you know, Judo-Christian culture. The summer was um, over a period of probably four or five months and two trips. It's a territory that, that I know well, so, so that facilitated things, because it, it, it can be a little bit tricky sort of to move and navigate sort of in, in, in the West Bank. I took that picture sort of at the, at the end of the day. The, the light was fading, and I was actually about to leave when this Palestinian family arrived, and two girls started entering the water. One of the girl entered and, and she played a while sort of in the water. I was just there sort of photographing them for, for a while. So at, at one point it was just us, so it was quite beautiful sort of end of day sort of with this magical sort of red light in this sort of very strange and beautiful sort of place. Paolo's photograph it has this beautiful universal appeal. Everyone, I believe, can relate to the lakeside. It has this beautiful, soft light. And all the politics and all the things that surround water in the Middle East, and it softens it. It softens that story so we can all relate to this wonderful moment with these two children at the Dead Sea. I particularly like that picture. I think it, it represents sort of like a real moment, sort of um, which which transcends the political sort of difficulties, and and it speaks about the water, about the issues, but but it also transcends them at the same time. So it's 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 a moment of quiet, like a universal moment of a child sort of bathing in in these sort of sacred waters. Number four, the assignment, the Hadza tribe of Tanzania. New York City studio photographer Martin Scholler trades the city streets for Tanzanian grasslands to photograph one of the oldest hunter-gatherer tribes in the world, the Hadza. I went to, to Africa with the idea of doing the same thing that I would normally do in, in the United States in the sense that I would bring all these lights, try to, to take these beautiful portraits that go beyond the normal uh, realm of just showing up with a camera and taking some snapshots. And the biggest obstacle is always photographing people that you can communicate well with is to make them seem relaxed and at ease with the situations. That they're being themselves rather than uh, being the afraid looking tribal member. Uh, you know this story is important not that any existing tribe today really lives like we all have lived 15,000 years ago. 15,000 years ago there were only hunter-gatherer uh, people and uh, it's, it's nice to have a record to, to, to show how these people live before they all vanish. Magazine photo editor Todd James works closely with Scholler on this story, his first for the magazine. So I work with photographers uh, on a story and I try and help them shape that story. It's like a text editor, it's just a sort of a different language, it's a visual language. Basically, this is where everything comes together. It starts to take form. The writer is working with their text editor. The photographer is working with me as a photo editor. And layout is sort of uh, waiting for this to, to, come, to come to their end of the hall, and this is where that happens. 
when we get into the layout process, uh, you know, you start to start to see the, the, the story take form. It starts to resemble what the reader is finally going to see. A lot of other magazines may send somebody into the field for a week or two, but they'll just run like three or four pictures on a topic. There won't be any real consideration about whether that really covers the topic. We devote more resources, more time, more money, more pages to photography than, than pretty much any magazine in the world. And, and to have those kind of resources is really, is really a sort of a great advantage. The magazine sought a fresh perspective from Scholler. His influences as a photographer uh, were different than many of the photographers who work here. Most of the photographers who shoot for us come out of a more of a, a newspaper tradition of photojournalism and a certain kind of formula or way of thinking about individual pictures and about the way the pictures go together. For me, there's a very, very sort of direct, wide-eyed curiosity. I mean, he's one of the most curious people I've ever met. That's sort of an essential element to me in terms of science, in terms of photojournalism, in terms of so many things. He photographs 112 tribe members. The young boy, Niga, in particular, attracts Chris John's attention. This one was special to me because of the innocence on the face, the little details that you see in a Martin Schroeder photograph of a bit of sand here and there in the face. I like the portrait because he has this, um, yeah, this pride in his eyes. He looks kind of strong. He was kind of my favorite kid because he wasn't as playful, he was more standoffish and he seemed a little bit smarter, a little bit more investigative. I wanted to make these portraits that feel a little bit more uh, personal, more intimate, to capture an intimate moment where the people is rather being themselves and laughing. So I like a lot of the pictures I've taken of these people that have a different energy to them where they're just having a good time dancing or um, talking to each other, being in a good mood that shows that they're just like us. Uh, but the Hods are very, very peaceful, very passive, very flexible people. They're not aggressive people uh, and, they, and they keep getting pushed around into a smaller and smaller place on the planet. So they know what the outside world looks like, what it means to live in the city. They just decided that they want to keep on living the way their, their ancestors have lived, for the most part. An average Hadza has a bow and arrow, a knife, maybe a blanket or two, a couple t-shirts. What I've learned from them is basically the, the obvious thing, that you don't need a lot of things to be happy. Number 10. The assignment, Amazon River Dolphins. In the red tannic waters of the Amazon River, there's a mysterious creature that's seldom been photographed, the Amazon River Dolphin. On his first assignment for the magazine, Kevin Schaefer swims the Amazon River to photograph unusual pink dolphins who've adapted to this unique freshwater environment. One of the things that really excited me about this project was nobody had really worked extensively with Amazon dolphins before. So it was a very eerie and quiet experience, particularly eerie and quiet when you can't see anything and suddenly these spirits come, uh, come appearing out of the gloom. It was really quite an amazing experience. One of the great challenges of this project was shooting underwater in the Amazon. Most of the Amazon is almost completely opaque. In fact, parts of it, you probably couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Visibility there is measured in inches, not in feet. So there were times when I could only see basically three feet in front of me. So I had to be pretty close to these dolphins uh, to get pictures of them. I was shooting within six to eight inches using very wide angle lenses, even fisheye lenses. And that allowed me to get both, you know, a, a picture of, of something that I couldn't see if it was more than six feet away, but also gave an intimacy, I think, to the picture. They were really right in my face. In fact, one of them was so in my face that he, uh, not out of aggression, but just out of playfulness, kicked my camera housing and shattered my housing and flooded my camera and put me out of action for a while. I was so haunted, in fact, by this need to get the defining picture of the dolphins in their environment that I, that I sort of sweated bullets. The whole time I was down there thinking, how am I going to get this? You never know when you go out on a project like this what you're going to come back with. 
but you have to aim high. You've got to, you know, have a number of things you want to get in. You rely on local expertise, on scientific knowledge, uh, researchers working with these animals on a regular basis to, to kind of help you, guide you towards uh, getting a variety of pictures. And I tried lots of things. We built platforms and trees. I would get up on top of that, shoot straight down. And then every time they passed underneath me, I could get actually a pretty good shot from above the water uh, because the water was so still, it was like glass. One memorable day, a, a mother and her baby came swimming over the tops of some submerged trees and allowed me to get a couple of pictures, one of which ended up in the story. In the water, down below me, I couldn't see anything. So my only solution then was to get underneath them. So I tried to come up with a solution uh, to get down underneath the dolphins, get them silhouetted against the sun or to show the, the forest above the water, which was something that I thought I might be able to get. So I came up with a really kind of ridiculous scheme where I took a big chunk of, of uh, scrap metal, tied a rope to it, and dropped it to the bottom of the river, then tied a float at the top. And I would, with my mask and snorkel, take a big gulp of air and pull myself down about eight to 10 feet underwater, and then hang onto the rope with one leg and one arm and shoot straight up. So I was able to actually silhouette the animals against the, you know, the overhead tropical sun in this water that's just, you know, the color of, I don't know, tomato juice, bright red. It just almost looks unnatural. The Amazon River Dolphin story is one of my favorites because it surprised me. I had heard of these creatures, but to actually see them and share them with our readers in the magazine gives us all a great deal of excitement. The main reason I thought this story was important was just people know so little about these animals. I mean, most people I've showed the pictures to or told the story of have said, I didn't know there was such a thing as an Amazon river dolphin, a freshwater dolphin living in the Amazon. How is that possible? I think what it does and why this picture appeals to people is because it's, it's that sense of intimacy. You sort of feel like these animals are just right there in front of you. You could almost go out and poke their belly button. They're that close. I chose this image because I feel like I'm really meeting a creature. And there's that connection, face to face, eye to eye, that is so appealing and makes me drawn into the creature's life and drawn into the magnificent habitat, the Amazon basin, where these Amazon dolphins live. Wes Giles came to us and told us about a magic place in the Bahamas. These blue holes where fresh water, seawater mix, one of the most dangerous places to dive in the world. There's this incredible dynamic flow that, that surges through these caves. If you get caught in one of those things when it's sucking, you die. This is a hydrogen sulfide environment. It's poisonous and toxic. We feel the effects when we're down in it. We have to limit our exposure. The Blue Holes of the Bahamas is one of those stories that I've wanted to do for 20 years. The project took almost a year to photograph. Wes chooses for his photo a place 80 feet underwater called the Cascadero. When you get into the Cascade Room, all of a sudden, boom, you're in it. You're in one of the most beautiful places on Earth. The Cascade Room photograph was a real endeavor. And my goal was to capture an image that translated to the audience what it feels like to be down inside the earth. All underwater cave photography is hard. We have uh, no real communication to talk to people. We are 100% dependent on a very, very talented team 
to operate lights and strobes and perform complex and difficult diving maneuvers. This is a complex picture. I had to figure out a way to do a transect line that will allow me to keep the camera at the same depth and keep it at the same angle in a cave. I had to find this spot that I could do this. I took it as a series of photographs. Only the central corridor would be lit and that above it would be black and below it would be black. Wes took great risk in his photographs. The long, narrow composition as he stitched picture after picture together so thoughtfully to make this compelling image that captures the mystery. A assignment like this, my photo count was 34,000 photographs. A great photograph is pure magic and it's amazing how seldom it actually occurs. I chose Wes Skiles' picture because he takes us to a place we've never seen before. It's a celebration of the diversity of the world and it's a celebration of exploration. My favorite picture for 2010 was made in the mountains of Afghanistan by Lindsay Adario. My assignment in Afghanistan was to photograph women in Afghanistan. It was something that National Geographic really hasn't done before doing the story many, many times. I mean, I was reduced to tears. You just repeatedly, repeatedly listen to women tell the story of how they've been beaten and how they set themselves on fire. And all I can do is tell their story. We were driving along the side of the road from five or six days covering maternal health. The number of women who die in childbirth is the second highest in the world. I saw two women on the side of the mountain that is quite unusual to see two women on the side of a mountain without a man. And so I told the driver to stop the car and I got out and ran up to the two women and it turned out that one was in labor and her water had just broken. So I sent my driver to go find the husband. They left me sitting with the two women and of course I couldn't communicate at all so I was just sort of sitting there <laughs> and trying to photograph but it's also very uncomfortable to photograph a woman when she's in labor and she's so uncomfortable being photographed and so it was this, this very awkward sort of scene.
I ended up taking both women and putting them in my car with the husband of the woman who was about to deliver, and we drove them to the hospital, and there she delivered safely. Afghanistan is a country that is incredibly dangerous to photograph, but it's also a place that I believe will experience more turmoil if women are not respected, if someone doesn't stop at the side of the road to give them a ride. And Lindsay Adario did that, and in the process made a magnificent picture that's worthy on hanging on a museum wall. Number eight, the assignment. Severe drought in southeastern Australia. I didn't think that I was going to be a photographer in college. Uh, I really loved photography, but uh, it wasn't something that I thought I would have a career at. Over 10 years ago, Amy Tunsing landed an internship with National Geographic. Editors at the magazine saw raw talent and gave her a shooting assignment when most interns weren't taking pictures. I feel like I've grown up with Geographic. I've really um, established myself as a photographer and my style and who I am, and it's been um, a really wonderful 10 years. Tun Singh journeys along the Murray-Darling River Basin in Australia to document the impact of a seven-year drought. This wasn't a story just about drought. It actually was also about management of a river system. And one of the main reasons that Geographic wanted to do this story is that there's so many places in the world right now that are having to deal with river management. And if we could shine a light on Australia and look at it, then maybe it would help the other places in the world. Tun Singh's job, to capture photos of the parched landscape and the farmers whose water allotment from the state has continued to shrink, threatening their livelihood. Recent rain offers a sign of hope. So Tunsing and the Booth family drive to check on the grazing fields for the family's cattle. It was very bittersweet because they were very happy about the rain they had gotten, but it was such a heavy downpour and it was mixed with hail that it had actually um, destroyed any little bit of um, vegetation that had grown. From the truck window, she sees a composition coming together. His two kids were with him and uh, we were just talking about the land, and, and I looked up, and I saw this whole scene starting to happen. A lot of times these things are sort of like a dance, and you start to sort of um, predict maybe what's going to happen. I liked the way that the door framed the moonscape, because when I was outside, you you kind of got lost in it. Like there was nothing to hold you in because it was so vast and it was so dry looking and it did look like such a moonscape that there was nothing to sort of highlight it or contain it, it just looked big. And so suddenly when it got framed in by the um, car door, it made some sense. I just started shooting it and then all of a sudden that one happened sand was blowing around and so she was just pushing her hair back. She was doing that often throughout that venture that we went on. Um, and that was it. And that was really the only frame that really worked. The rest of the frames were interesting, but that was the one that really, really worked. This picture is very close to photographic perfection. Yet, it's not just a photograph for the sake of photography. It tells the story of a parched landscape, the attentiveness of a father, the harshness of the weather, the little girl with her hands on her face. This picture is extraordinary. This picture is a classic example of photojournalism that crosses the line from journalism into the realm of art. Number six, the assignment, the changing face of Islam in Indonesia. Jim Noctwe came to us with an idea. He wanted to go to Indonesia and photograph a country that is the largest Muslim population of any nation in the world. 
Through most of my career, I've concentrated on conflicts and critical social issues. It's taken me to many wars all over the world beginning in 1981, virtually every continent. Many, many wars in, in contemporary history. His photography covers not only war, but worldwide social conflict, which is what he explores in Indonesia. So it's a kind of sleeping giant. It's traditionally been a very tolerant society. Um, it has accepted secular practices, has accepted other religions and other cultures. And in recent years, there's been a strain of fundamentalism that's come into Indonesia and even radicalism and violence. So it's very important to understand what Indonesia really is. And I think in doing this story, we were trying to enlighten people about the unique nature of Indonesia. It is a very powerful geographic and demographic force in Southeast Asia. We have no political agenda. We want to be the place you come for trusted information that will help cut away the bureaucracy and agendas and all the things that, that can happen to us when we're trying to get to the bottom of something. Nakhtwe's story covers the many faces of Islam here, but his top 10 image depicts devout Muslims who do not condone violence. Jim Nakhtwe's picture from Indonesia is haunting. It's mysterious, yet the form is beautiful. On Sulawesi, at a commune called An Nadzir, Nakhtwe finds a very devout approach to Islam. This is at the feast of um, Eid al-Adha, which is the day of sacrifice. I made this picture on the borderline between childhood and womanhood. The women are all covered in full chador. The child is still uncovered, uh, except for her head. You can see her face, you can see her identity, her personality. She's got a kind of innocence and playfulness to her. She can see her moving her arms almost as if she's flying. And what she faces in her future is what we see behind her. This is another one of those photographs that goes from powerful photojournalism to art. This is a photograph that connects me, even though there's this mystery of who those people are behind the veil, connects me with my fellow man. As a journalist, my goal is always to create awareness and understanding. Uh, because Indonesia is such a large force in the world, I think there are you know, a lot of people in this world who put their life at risk for something they believe in. The higher cause of journalism is to serve humanity. The change cannot happen until we identify what's wrong. I believe journalism is a service industry and the service we provide is awareness.